This week on Africa Weekly, we're focusing on Uganda and the rising number of children becoming victims of human sacrifice rituals. We'll head to the mines of Katanga in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where power is in short supply. And finally to Botswana in a sanctuary for Africa's elephants fleeing the deadly grip of poachers. But first, a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. Chad announced on Thursday that its warplanes bombed Boko Haram positions in neighboring Nigeria to avenge Monday's twin suicide bombings that left 33 people dead and more than 100 injured. Chad's military vowed it would continue its merciless pursuit of the Islamist insurgents. On Tuesday, an Egyptian court upheld a death sentence imposed on former President Mohamed Morsi, accused of plotting jailbreaks and attacks on police during the 2011 uprising that drove Hosni Mubarak from power. Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir, accused of long-standing war crimes during the Darfur conflict, which left 300,000 people dead, defied an international criminal court call for his arrest during his attendance of the African Union summit in Johannesburg on Sunday. A smiling al-Bashir posed for a family photo and flew out of South Africa the following day. In Central Africa, the holy month of Ramadan begins in a climate of tension, with a strong French military presence maintaining a fragile peace. Meanwhile in Bangui, Muslims and Christians have joined forces to rebuild a mosque, a first in an area where Muslims were violently expelled by anti-Balaka militants following a coup in March 2013. And finally, we bring you these images from Dakar Fashion Week, which took place last weekend, giving traditional African designs a modern twist. In Uganda, the practice of human sacrifice still leaves its scars. Police records show that there were 10 cases of ritual killings in 2013 nine last year, and already five confirmed cases of children being sacrificed this year. A 10 centimeter long scar on the back of the neck will be a lifetime reminder for 11-year-old Kanani Nankunda of the day his sister was killed and her organs harvested as part of human sacrifice ritual. All I remember is when we were playing together. Kanani was cut and left to die, while his sister's body was mutilated in human sacrifice ritual. Since then, Kanani has become withdrawn and fears strangers and new places. Child sacrifice cases involve killing of a child and harvesting their blood, organs or limbs for use in witchcraft ritual. Exact numbers are hard to establish. Members of Ugandan NGO Champisi Child Care Ministries say they receive reports of several cases each month usually children. And then the people that are really targeted are children because they find them working, working, going to school or going home or going to fetch water. So that is when they get the children. They, they actually kill children more than the adults. Yeah. Witchcraft isn't a belief confined to the poor or uneducated. According to Uganda's Anti-Human Sacrifice and Trafficking Task Force, suspects are also among the highest social groups. We even suspect that even senior politicians, that senior politicians, say senior civil citizens, uh, they, 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 who have that belief, because it is the issue is of, of mindset, who believes in witchcraft can go to that level of sacrificing because either they want to maintain their positions on the job or in, 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 in the government or because they want to get wedded. The man who attacked Kanani and killed his sister had been given a prison sentence for attacking the boy, but not yet for killing his sister. The sentence I want him to get is the death penalty, so that he can be an example to others. While believers think that witch doctors can cure their problems, the victims of these rituals are left shattered, this family destroyed by the belief that their children should give the ultimate sacrifice. Lubumbashi, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo's Katanga province, is the country's economic powerhouse. 
Much of the city's wealth comes from mining copper and cobalt. But chronic power shortages are threatening production. We can't reach 1,500,000 tonnes of copper without energy. And to have energy, we must invest in whatever energy infrastructure there is. And we have to wait for these investments, or they won't be enough to ensure that level of production. Power plants in the country are dilapidated and regularly taken out of service for maintenance checks. With the energy deficit for the mining sector in Katanga rated at 600 megawatts, the industry is crying out for new power plants to be built. But for now, the public electricity company Esnel is sticking to simply repairing the existing power plants instead. With these rehabilitation efforts, we think that after one year, SNEL will be able to increase the installed power. This privately owned factory extracts cobalt, copper and zinc oxide from a mountain of slag located outside the capital. It takes 34 megawatts of electricity to power the giant furnace to operate at full capacity. But DR Congo's national power company, Esnel, is only supplying 24 megawatts, and power cuts are common. If the network switches off, the large oven also goes off. The induction furnace is also stopped. All production is stopped. The ongoing power shortages mean miners have to install generators or import electricity from Zambia. For the Chinese company CDM, the lack of power forced them to cut 300 jobs. We can't work with the little power we have. This is what forced us to shut down the four furnaces and lay off all those people working with us. The problem is far from resolved. Although the government is eager to promote the further expansion of the mining sector, the country's energy sector remains fragile. The Chobe River is a piece of elephant paradise. Massacred in their tens of thousands for their ivory tusks, the continent has fewer than 470,000 left. But here in Botswana, with its unfenced parks and wide open spaces, about a third of Africa's wild pachyderms have found their sanctuary. These animals are highly intelligent. When they're being disturbed in another area, they will move to where they know they're going to be safe. And in the case of Botswana, a lot of our elephants are essentially political refugees, fleeing persecution in neighboring countries. The secret to this success is sheer political will. Slightly bigger than France and with a population of just two million, Botswana enjoys immense expanses of wild terrain, from the Kalahari Desert to the Okavango Delta. And the government has prioritized quality ecotourism as a sustainable source of income, even more so than its diamonds. Botswana is lucky because it's got such a great landmass of national park. In South Africa, for example, they're so small and privatized and so commercial that you're never alone. So you've always got a lot of other tourists around. Um, whereas Botswana, you you know, you can be in Miremi and not see another car for the whole day. Last year, the government banned commercial hunting and has adopted a zero tolerance approach to dealing with the ongoing poaching that has plagued so much of Southern Africa. If you come into this country with a weapon to shoot one of our resources. If you are going to leave and think you'd leave with your life, you're going to be disappointed. And I'm not going to apologize for that. It is the way it is. Man and beast coexisting side by side doesn't always work. For some villages, elephants can be a crop destroying menace. But by redistributing the wealth from state-sponsored tourism projects, like this park and cultural center in the northern town of Kasani, Botswana hopes to protect its natural heritage. In Kenya, a game of cricket gone wild. On Sunday, a Maasai cricket team decided to play a match in a wildlife conservancy in central Kenya to raise awareness about the plight of rhinos, following a massive upsurge in poaching in recent years. And in South Africa, CEOs of over 200 companies donned their coziest PJs and nightcaps to camp out on the streets on the coldest night of the year in a charity fundraising stunt for a child welfare NGO. Next week we return to Uganda, this time to check out the motorbike taxis introducing safety and technology to Kampala's congested roads. And we head to the coast of Senegal, which have become a haven for surfers. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week.